All right, so in this video, we are going to put our Boolean values and all those operators we talked about in the last video to use. Uh, we'll have a talk about structures in code, and then we'll get into if then else, uh, which actually lets you run um, certain pieces of code based on Boolean values. So let's get into it. Um, we're actually going back to uh, F4.1 and F4.2, talking about selection structures and the if then else statement. And then we'll go back through uh, 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5 in order, mostly just because I'm providing a couple of examples from those sections. But if you actually take a brief perusal of those yourself, um, those examples are really cool, and the way that they build up to them is really helpful, so you might find additional benefit from just taking a brief look at it. But let's get into uh, my explanation of that kind of stuff. All right, so in programming, uh, we have these very um, theoretical ideas of a control structure, which essentially are just structures in code that control the order in which instructions are processed, and they actually can contain other structures as well. For example, the sequence structure actually runs every instruction that it has in order. It's just a collection of pieces of code that get executed in order. You know, first line, second line, third line, fourth line, etc., etc. And you've been working entirely in sequence structures. Uh, every time you write code inside of a procedure, you are filling out a sequence structure because all of your code is just running in order with no surprises. Uh, every procedure is likely going to contain at least one. Uh, usually that's going to be our variable declaration. Those lines where we declare the variables are all going to be run in order. So pretty much all of the time you're going to have that sequence structure where you declare your variables at the very uh, top of the procedure if you are declaring them at the top of the procedure, and you should be declaring them at the top of the procedure. It's very helpful. I talked about that before. But you're used to the sequence structure. We're going to talk about a different structure uh, in this chapter, though. This chapter is all about the selection structure, which runs some instructions conditionally. Uh, it, it is selecting in a sense, which instructions are actually being run based on some kind of condition that is true or false, a Boolean expression, in fact, that evaluates to true or false. But it's deciding based on that condition, based on the value of the condition, whether it's true or false, it's deciding, you know, do I run this whole, uh, bunch of instructions, instruction set A, or do I run instruction set B? And this is also where um, structures containing other structures kind of come in because you can get selection structures that contain sequence structures if you have just a line of code that conditionally runs. Um, or not a line of code, but a, several lines of code that conditionally runs, but they all run in order. That's a selection structure in there inside of that sequence structure. And of course, there are more types of control structures. We actually will cover another one pretty soon. But right now, all we have are sequence and selection. Now, there are multiple types of selection structures based on how exactly they work. Uh, the first is a single alternative selection structure, which contains one uh, statement block. A statement block is essentially just a uh, collection of statements that will all get run. Uh, and that statement block is known as the true path because those instructions, the statement block, all of that is only run when the associated condition, the condition that's associated with our single alternative selection structure, is true. So. The selection here is based on whether the condition is true. Do we run the statement block in the true path, or do we skip the statement block and we just start running all the code that comes after the selection structure? 
that's what's going on there. That's how it's a selection structure, is it's selecting what code gets run next. Here's an example of a single alternative selection structure that is kind of more of a real life example, right? If it is snowing outside, that's the condition, is the claim it is snowing outside. If that claim is true, we will wear a heavy coat, we will wear boots, and we will wear gloves. That true path is wearing all of those articles of clothing. That is the statement block as well. Wear a heavy coat, wear boots, wear gloves, that all compresses the statement block, and it all happens to be a, um, you know, a sequence structure because they're all being executed in order. We put on the heavy coat before the boots, before the gloves. And then of course we have this end if to let whoever is looking at it know that we're no longer doing things only if it is snowing outside. Anything that happens after the end if will happen no matter if it is snowing outside or not snowing outside. So if our condition is false, if I claim that it is snowing outside and that evaluates to be a false claim when I look out and it's actually uh, the middle of July and everyone is like sweating through their shirts, right? Then I don't do anything inside of the true path and I just do everything. I just skip to after this end if right here. And if tells Visual Basic, hey, stop running this stuff, this stuff only if it's true and just get to running everything as normal. But if the condition is false, we skip to the end if and then move on. So after the end if, it might be something like open the door, go outside. That will happen no matter if it's snowing outside or if it's not snowing outside. The only difference being, if it is snowing outside, before we open the door and go outside, we're wearing the heavy coat, we're wearing the boots, we're wearing the gloves. Now here is our flowchart representation of a single alternative structure. Um, because of course you should be using flowcharts and pseudocode and all that kind of stuff to plan out your, um, your code, right? And we could actually consider up here this being sort of a type of pseudocode although it's more describing real life stuff in a pseudocode form, but this is kind of what pseudocode might look like. Uh, similarly, this is my, what a flowchart might look like for uh, our single alternative selection structure. We have this diamond right here, which signifies that we're making a choice based on this condition. That's what the diamond is or the sideways uh, square or however you want to put it. But inside of the diamond, we put our condition. Snowing outside? Question mark? If this is true, if it is true that it is snowing outside, we have one branch that goes out. You know, it doesn't have to go to the side, but we have one branch labeled T. That T is essentially the value of our condition. The F is also the value of the condition. So the branch is coming out of a... Uh, one of these diamond, you know, like condition uh, things. Any branch coming out of that has to have the value of that condition. So in this case, true, we follow the true path if it is indeed snowing outside. And then we have all of our actions instead of our orange rectangles. Wear a heavy coat, wear boots, wear gloves. And then we meet up with the false path because the false path just goes on forward to whatever happens after the single alternative selection structure. The true path meets up with it and then both follow this arrow down here after the, um, you know, after the whole statement block is done. So that's what the flowchart looks like. Now, the way that Visual Basic has implemented a single alternative, um, selection structure is using an if then statement, which is a statement that takes in a condition and a statement block, just like a single alternative selection structure, because it is one. The condition must be a Boolean expression. It must be an expression that in the end evaluates to either true or false. Now in your journey to getting to truth or not truth, um, you can use pretty much anything. You can use variables, named constants, literals, properties, methods, 
um, keywords, arithmetic operators, comparison operators, and logical operators, so long as you end up with a Boolean value at the very end. Anything is free game. You just got to do the right comparisons and the right logical operations and all that kind of stuff to get to the desired Boolean expression that accurately represents the condition that you want to use in order to enter the statement block if it's true versus not enter it if it's false. Of course, the statement block runs if the condition evaluates to true, and it's great for checkboxes in your um, in your applications. Now, this is actually a, uh, a nod to some stuff that happens in the apply the concepts side of things, which I will not be covering, but they talk about how to use checkboxes in order to have the user give you input and you can test for that input by testing if the checkbox is checked. And if the checkbox is checked, then you can take certain actions in the code, like set variables to certain values or whatever. So I uh, recommend that you read through, apply the concepts as usual. You should go through that and you should practice that, or at least look through it and reference it when you're doing the programming assignments, right? They give you really good instructions on how to use all that kind of stuff. I've got some example pseudocode that uses if then, um, and this actually is for a pretend application that does the opposite of the circle area application that we talked about before. In this case, what we're doing is taking in the area of a circle and then giving the user the radius back out. However, if the user gives us um, zero, for the area of the circle, we know that the radius is zero. And if they give us a negative number, we can't take the square root of a negative number, so we shouldn't actually do the square root, right? Uh, in the case of the area being zero, we know that the radius is going to be zero, so we don't have to actually do the calculation already. Uh, and both of the issues of negative area and zero area can be solved by only doing the calculation if the radius is positive and letting the default zero value that is given to double area when we declare it be the sign to the user that they give us a bad value. So what happens first is we declare double area and double radius because we're getting the area from the user and we will be taking in the radius. Or sorry, we will be calculating the radius and giving that back. Uh, we convert text area to dot text to a double, store that in double area. If the area of the circle is positive, then we know we're okay to make the calculation because it's not a negative area. We won't run into any troubles by taking the square root of a negative number. And also, it's not zero, which means that we actually do care about making the calculation, since if it was zero, we just give them the zero that's already in double area when we declared it. So, we assert that the area of the circle is positive. And if it is true, if that assertion is true, if it's evaluated to be a true um, expression, then Visual Basic will take us into here. It will divide double area by pi and take the square root of it. Since pi are squared, we're kind of reversing pi are squared here. And then it stores it in double radius. So all of a sudden, double radius now has a non-zero value because the area is positive. If the area wasn't positive, double radius would still be zero. So... Once we've actually stored all of this in double radius, we end the if statement. And then no matter what double radius has, whether it's some value because the area was positive, or if it was zero because the area was invalid or zero, no matter what, we're okay to display that to the user because we're either giving them a valid uh, answer or we're saying, hey, your numbers were whack, try again. 
So we take the value of double radius, whatever it might be, no matter if it was positive or not, the area was positive or not. We take that value and we stick it in label radius.txt. Of course, we have to do our two string method, but you know, this is pseudocode. We don't have to worry about that yet. And that's the idea of this procedure. This would be like a button calc underscore click or something like that type of procedure. Now the actual syntax when you're typing an if then statement into Visual Basic is going to be this. It's if, and then you type your condition, you type your Boolean expression. And then after the Boolean expression, you type then, capital T, capital I for if, capital T for then. After that, you have your statement block, which is essentially normal code, but you indent it. And the indentation tells Visual Basic, hey, this is, well, it, it doesn't, maybe by itself, it doesn't tell Visual Basic that it's inside of the if statement. Visual Basic may or may not get mad. I wouldn't test it. I would indent it just in case, but you know, you have the end of here. So, you know, regardless, you indent your statement to show that the statement block belongs to the if statement. And that's really helpful for human readability. This is going to be at least one statement, because if there are zero statements, then why bother? It's going to be at least one statement. Um, probably more. And all of those will only run if the condition evaluates to true. So everything you want to run only when the condition is true, you put indented underneath the if then part of the statement. And then at the very end, unindented, you type end if to tell Visual Basic I am done writing the if statement. Everything after this, everything, every line of code that shows up after this end if is going to be run no matter what. If condition is true, everything in the statement block gets run and then it runs all of these codes down, lines of code down here. If condition is false, it just skips to end if and then goes to the next line and uh, runs everything. So no matter what, it's running all these statements after end if. All right, so here is the code associated with that pseudocode that I gave before for calculating the radius of a circle based on its area. So I declare the uh, variables, and of course they have default values, so zero in both of them. And then I try to parse text area dot text where the user has input the area of the circle as a double and stick that into double area. Now, a cool thing about the way that the program is actually set up is that if text area dot text holds an invalid number, for example, they typed in a character, you know, maybe they typed in blah or they typed in four dash two or something like that, right? Double area is going to hold zero, which means that we never enter this if statement, which means that we, we display zero to the user, which is sort of our invalid value answer, right? So that's really helpful, um, very almost accidentally so. Regardless, if double area is greater than zero, then we can say, uh, you know, double area is greater than zero. We know that it, we have a valid area, which means that we can safely calculate the radius. Double area divided by our pi class constant probably to the power of one half, which is the same thing as square rooting it. We set that into the double radius value inside of the if statement. And then we end if. Now, if this is true, then we successfully update the value of the radius, even though it's like indented in here, because we declared it out here inside of the, you know, at the top of the procedure, this value actually stays, you know, once we leave the if statement, we still have double radius as the calculated value. It's not zero anymore. It's only zero if double area is less than or equal to zero. But then no matter what we get, whether it's um, zero or greater than zero, we will display it to the user. So inside of the text property, we um, call double radius as two string method, passing in the, uh, uh, the formatting string n2 to say it's a number, format it like a number with 
two decimal points. And that's that. Here are some examples of if-then conditions. We actually saw most of these. Um, everything up until uh, string continue is not equal to the letter n. We saw most of those in the previous video. And I'll give the same disclaimer that I did before about the string comparisons being weird, and we'll talk about it in a future video. But this is what all of those comparisons look like inside of if statements. And then we also have some interesting ones. If boolean is insured is true, then do stuff. Or if boolean is insured is false, then do stuff, right? So we're checking to see if the boolean variable here has the value true. If true equals true, then do something, right? And if false equals false, then do something. However, if boolean is insured is true, then why check to see if it's true? Because, you know, true equals true is true, but this whole thing will only be true when boolean insured is true. Because if boolean is, in, is insured is false, false equals true is a false statement, so the if statement doesn't enter. So this whole boolean condition is contingent on the value of boolean is insured. Specifically, this condition, boolean is, boolean is insured equals true, is exactly the same as the truth value of boolean is insured. And you can check this on your own. If you check the truth values of boolean is insured by itself versus the check, you know, checking the values for boolean is insured equals true, right? They'll be exactly the same. Similarly, if boolean is insured equals false, this whole thing is only going to be true when boolean is insured is false. And the whole thing is only going to be false when boolean is, is insured is true. So the whole equals false thing doesn't even matter because the whole statement only relies on not the value of boolean is insured, but the negation of the value of boolean is insured. Because if boolean is insured is false, we want the whole thing to be true. And if boolean is insured is true, we want the whole thing to be false. Why not just check the negation of boolean is insured here? And we can save time. We don't even have to worry about the equals false thing, right? Or we can check the value of boolean is insured here, which we'll be doing anyway in order to evaluate whether or not it's true, like equal to true. Why don't we just check the value and ignore the actual equality? Because if we check the value, we know we're good or not immediately. We don't need to worry about it. It's basically short circuit evaluation, except the programming language doesn't know that it's short circuit evaluation. But it's contingent on the fact that these are static, you know, true and false. So we can actually simplify these. For boolean is insured equals true, we can just replace it with if boolean is insured. We're actually able to do this because a boolean variable is in and of itself a boolean expression. It can be used as a condition. You can actually set a particular boolean variable based on what the user is doing and then test the value of that boolean variable just like this. For example, they check a check mark to say that they want to see the picture of a pizza and then we can say, okay, if they check that check mark, if that check mark checked value is true, then show the picture of the pizza. We don't have to just do this with Boolean variables that we make. Like I mentioned, we can do this with the values, the properties of a check mark that are true when the check mark is checked and false when the checkbox is not checked. So that's actually an option to us. We can put the whole checkbox is checked property here. I don't remember the name off the top of my head, unfortunately, but we can put that here. If it is checked, then, you know, we're good to go. We don't even need to bother with saying, hey, is the checkmark checked? Set a Boolean variable. Is the Boolean variable true? You know, all that kind of stuff. We can just say, is the checkmark, the checkbox checked? But this thing actually really simplifies things a lot. It makes it a lot easier. We can set these Boolean, uh, we call them flags. To say, hey, 
uh, this is a flag to say that there's some property of the program that needs to happen or whatever. Like, you know, hey, this person is insured. Do the actions for them being insured or something like that. We call that a flag because we can use it to alert the computer like, hey, this is what's happening. Now, similarly, if we're checking if a variable holds false, we don't need to say is the variable equal to false. We can just say if not, boolean is insured. I am claiming that the very that the variable boolean is insured is false. I am claiming that whoever is not insured. If that condition is true, then that's what's happening here. Up here, it's I am claiming boolean is insured is true. Down here, it's I am claiming uh, the negation of boolean is insured is true. I'm claiming that boolean is insured is false. And if it is true that boolean is insured is false, then this whole thing is a true statement. And then we go into the actual if statements statement block. And you can check the um, you can check the fact that these are the same thing as well uh, by you know running different truth values or something like that. All right, and now we get into the dual alternative selection structure, which is even more powerful because we get two statement blocks, the true path and the false path. Now the true path, exactly the same as before, right? We run our condition. If it's true, we run the true path. However, now if it's false, we run the false path. So we're running blocks of code no matter what, um, which is great. You know, if we need to do something special, if our condition is false, then we can use a dual alternative selection structure like this. Here's a comparison between our single alternative example that we saw before and the dual alternative example. In this case, we have the condition. Uh, the claim I'm making is the number of guests is at least 200, greater than or equal to 200. If my condition is true, I go down the true path. I reserve the large banquet hall, I hire a band. And then I hit this else Thing, right? The else is essentially, you know, signifies the beginning of the false path. It says uh, this, you know, if it's true, do the true stuff. Otherwise, do the false stuff. But once I hit else right here, that's my signal to skip everything else and go directly to end if. Now, if the condition is false, if the number of guests is 199, um, then I can skip everything in the true path, I skip directly to else and then go down the false path. I reserve the small banquet hall and I hire a DJ. I hit the end of and I start doing the lines of code afterwards. So true path, you go down, uh, when the condition is true, you go down the true path. Once you hit else, you skip to end if, run all the code below. If the condition is false, you skip to else, run down the false path, and then hit end if, do all the code below. Here's a comparison of the flowcharts right here. Now in single alternative, we had the false path just go directly down to the rest of the code while the true path met up with the false path and then followed. Now we have the true path doing its own thing and the false path doing its own thing. They both have their own statements and then they meet in the middle and then continue on with the rest of the procedure. So that's how the flowcharts look different for dual alternative versus single. In Visual Basic, this is implemented as an if-then-else statement. So it's a statement that takes in a condition and two statement blocks. One, the condition must be a Boolean expression. One statement block runs if the condition evaluates the true. The other runs if the condition evaluates the false. And it's great for radio buttons, which we also talk about in the Apply the Concept section, which is why you should check out the Apply the Concept section. But it allows you to check, you know, if there's two radio buttons, that means that the user can only select one of those radio buttons, those little circle buttons that only let you choose one at a time, as opposed to a check mark where you can do as many as you want. The radio buttons only let you do one at a time. Uh, so if you select the top one, the bottom one is unselected. If you select the bottom one, the top one is unselected. And that's great because you can test like, hey, is the top one selected? Do this thing. Otherwise, do the, the other thing, since there's only two options for this particular example of radio buttons. If you need to use more than two radio buttons, we have stuff for that, but that's coming up in a future video. All right, so here is some pseudocode for a modification of our uh, calculating the circle's radius from its area code that I showed before. 
Now this one is uh, different because I'm actually taking advantage of the if then else structure in order to give the user a more um, you know, prominent warning that they've entered a bad value because before we just put zero, which is valid for, you know, if they gave us an area of zero, but it's invalid if they typed in letters and stuff or if they gave us a negative number. What I wanted to do was specifically give them a value that would, um, no, specifically give them a value that would alert them, hey, something's wrong here. In this case, negative one. If they see that the radius is negative one, that's going to look fishy because a circle's radius should be positive, right? And all of this, by the way, is probably going to hinge on us telling the user in the application, hey, give us a positive area, don't give us zero. Specifically because of the way that the um, conversion to a text using uh, triparse gives, gives us a zero if there's an error, we can't actually handle the zero right now, unfortunately. But, um, well, hmm. there are ways... I don't want to write out all the code for it because given what we have right now, it would be a little bit annoying. Um, regardless, uh, we have this pseudocode where you know, we convert the area that is given to us by the user to a double and store that in double area. And then we check if the area of the circle is positive. Same as, if we do it, we do the calculation, sort in double radius, skip to end if, display double radius and label radius all text, as we've seen before. Where it's different is, if this claim is false, the area of the circle is positive. If that's false, if we get zero signifying an error up here, or the user typing in zero, or uh, a negative number, signifying the user typed in a negative number, then we know it's not valid. We know we can't do the calculation like this. So um, what we have to do instead is we jump down to the else and we'll give the user the error by storing negative one in double radius. When we store negative one in double radius, then we go to the end if and display negative one to the user. So no matter what, we're displaying something to the user that something is contained in double radius. However, it might be a valid radius if they gave us a valid value, or it might be negative one if they give us an invalid value. So no matter what, you know, we're giving them some piece of information after the if then else, right? So that's actually pretty cool. We're able to sort of use this in a multi-purpose way in order to convey multiple different types of information to our user, thanks to the power of the if then else pseudocode. However, what if we wanted to instead give them a better, like more appropriate message? Like, hey, you know, get, you need to enter a better value for area or something like that, right? We wanna actually give them that message. However, if we're trying to use double radius as the thing that we are displaying in label radius alt text, that's not going to be possible specifically because double radius is a double and using option like implicit off and explicit on and all that kind of stuff, which you should be using, using all of that, we, um, we can't actually store a string in double radius, especially not a string that has characters in it, even if we had implicit on or something like that, it would turn into zero. We would just be storing zero into radius and that's not really helpful. So we can use the if then else statement in a slightly different way to make our dreams possible of actually showing them a helpful error message. Here's how we can do that. We declare double area and double radius, convert it to a double as normal. If the area of the circle is positive, you know, the, we did the same calculation, right? But then we do something different, which is we actually display double radius in label radius.txt inside 
of our if statement. So this, we only display double radius in label radius.txt if the area is valid and we're actually able to calculate the radius, which means if the area is not valid, we are not displaying the radius to the user. Instead, if the area of the circle is non-positive, if it's zero or negative, we are displaying the string area must be positive in label radius.txt. The reason why we're displaying these inside of the branches or the paths of our if statement is because we're displaying different things depending on the condition. It's not double radius each time. If it was double radius both times, we could put it at the end. But we're displaying something different in label radius.txt. So we are putting it inside of the branches right here. Now with if statements, it can be easy to accidentally put repeated code inside of the branches of an if statement. But what you should do is inside of your if statement, you only put the code that absolutely cannot be repeated or put outside of the if statement. You only put the code that you need to execute conditionally. We are only calculating the radius if the circle is positive, if the area of the circle is positive. And we are only displaying that radius in label radius.txt if the area of the circle is positive. Anything we do after that that is shared by the false path as well, we can put after our end if. For example, like what we did up here. When we were, um, when our error value was negative one, no matter what, we displayed double radius in label radius cell text. If I had it both in the true path and the false path, that would be redundant. That'd be extra typing or some extra copying and pasting. Uh, if I recognize that there's an error in this line right here and it was in both paths, I really have to be careful to make sure I fixed both of them because if I didn't fix both of them and if I left one of them as incorrect, that could be bad if we go through one of the paths. And unfortunately, I have had students do that where they put a ton of repeated code inside of branches of if statements, something like 20 lines that were exactly the same inside of the branch. In fact, I think they put the entirety of the rest of their program inside of each branch rather than putting stuff like putting that repeated code outside of the if statements and just running it down here and doing all those calculations and stuff, right? Um, so that was unfortunately to their detriment because they had fixed errors in one branch, but those errors still persisted in another branch and they lost points because of that. So any um, repeated code that you're able to put after the um, if statement or before the if statement even, you should put after or before if at all possible. It's possible you have repeated code that you do need to repeat because it actually depends on unique things that are inside of each branch. And at that point, repeated code is fine. Like a calculation that depends on things that are completely differently calculated in each branch. That's totally fine. But the stuff at the very end that's repeated or stuff that like is intermixed with things that have to be inside of unique branches, but actually doesn't depend on anything and can be moved outside of the if statement, right? All that kind of stuff should be outside the if statement. So you're saving yourself some time and typing and the you're not worrying about like possible mistakes for not copying things correctly or not applying fixes to duplicated code. All right, so here is our if then else syntax, very similar to if then. However, we also have this else thing right here, which I've put in brackets because the if then else is, you know, if then statements are pretty much if then else statements. I kind of made them up a little bit because they really are if then else at the very end of things. It's just that the else is optional. If you type else, then you ha then you need an indented statement block for the false path. You know everything that is processed at the condition evaluates the false. You don't need the else block, and you don't need the uh, false path if you don't need the else part, right? 
uh, if you don't put the else, but you still put the false path in there, then uh, Visual Basic will just assume everything is the true path, and you don't want that. But this is our syntax. If condition, then you write the true path, indented. And then unindented, you write else if you do want to do the false path. And if you don't, do the if you don't want the false path, you ignore all of this completely. But if you do, you type else, indent again, write out the false path, unindent, type end if, Continue on with your code. All right, so here is the code for the first um, pseudocode that I showed, the one where we use negative one as our error message to the user. Um, if the condition is true, we do the calculation for double radius, uh, convert that to a number with two decimal points using this conversion string for two string, and then send that to label radius text. If double area is less than or equal to zero, Pop down to the else, set that to negative uh, one, convert that to a string, correct formatting, yada yada, set that to label radius dot text. Uh, so that's the first example that I showed. And the second one right here, where we have two separate assignments of uh, different values to label radius dot text. And the first one, we're assigning it the um, value of the you know double converted to a string using two string and the second one we assigned it to this string right here now what we could do if we wanted to is have something like this but then we have like a string radius variable where we convert this to double radius dot two string and then we have uh, in the else path we set the string radius to area must be positive and then outside sort of like what we have here we set label radius dot text to the string radius. We could do that. Um, I'm not a fan of that because of the fact that we are uh, putting an error message inside of this string radius type thing. So I, I wouldn't do that personally. It can get a little bit confusing, especially because string radius, you're expecting the value for the radius. If you're also putting messages to the user there, that can get a little complicated. So. I wouldn't I would I would avoid that kind of thing. But this if you're trying to either output a number or a error message like this, this is probably a good method to use. All right, here is an example out of F4.3. I'm not going to run through the entire example that they give, but they do a really good job of working through actually motivating this problem right here and making this if statement. So I think it's a good example to read through and see like, okay, why are they doing this? Why did they set up the if statement like this? So single alternative, um, of course. And then here is a double or uh, yeah, a double alternative, dual alternative um, example that they gave. Again, they kind of work through it um, themselves. I, I do recommend you check that out, especially, you know, we talked about this double hours example in the last video, but here, like, this is actually motivating double hours as a, um, as a condition that's going to be used in a dual alternative thing where they can catch, you know, an invalid number of hours entered as being worked, maybe from a human error or a computer error or someone didn't show up to work or something like that they have this label variable showing what the um or sorry not label they have like this uh label showing the gross text with an error message here not a descriptive error message by the way you should make your messages to the user more descriptive if you have room on the form or if you're able to make a label in the form with messages to these or something like that. But I don't know. But they have this message out to the user, and then they also have the conversion of the gross rate calculation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so F4.3 and F4.4 have great res uh, examples. Now, very briefly, I want to talk about the key press events that are talked about in A4.6, because I think these are really interesting. Um, the key pressed is when the user presses a key inside of a text box. Uh, a, an event 
gets called for um, the user pressing the key. It's a key press event. And then you can actually handle that using an event procedure. Um, now you have two parameters right here, the sender parameter, which is sort of the thing that sent this, um, you know, the, the, the thing that actually sent this event and then the E parameter, which is the event itself. Um, sender can be, we have sender as object, you know, these, uh, parameters these are called parameters. Well, I think we'll get to that later, but just know that they're called parameters right here. Sort of like the uh, declaring a procedure version of putting arguments in a method. Anyway, these parameters right here are when you actually fill out this procedure, these parameters get filled with things when they're called by the program. So for example, the button click type of procedures like that. You had these um, sender and E parameters right here, and that got filled out with information about the actual click event that happened. Sender being whatever button was pressed, and E being the um, specific type of event. In this case, for a key press, it's a key press event org, but it'd be different for, um, it'd be a different you know sort of type for button stuff. That might be a little bit too much detail, but these are known as parameters. They get filled out with something when this procedure is called, and when the procedure is called, you can work with those somethings in order to do things. Um, sender's object right here actually refers to the fact that the sender could be anything. It could be any type of control, and there's no guarantee that it's a specific type. So the object is essentially like a, it's something who knows, kind of declaration. Okay, but the E parameter of the key press event actually has information about what keys are pressed. Uh, for example, e.keychar, the key char property of E is a string containing the, the uh, pressed key. It's the character of that the user is trying to type in to the text box. For example, if I... Um, have a text box on my circle area program and I try to press the letter K, then e.k char would get a string containing the letter K, either uppercase or lowercase, depending on if I'm trying to do an uppercase or lowercase K. You know, if I press, sh if I press and hold shift and then press K, it sends an uppercase K, not like shift and then K. And if I just press the K button, it uh, shows the lowercase K. If I try to press a number, it's a string containing a num like just the individual number that it tried to type. And there's tons of these events if you're typing a lot of stuff. If you're typing at 120 words per minute instead of a text box, that's, um, you know, however many characters that entails, which is quite a bit. I don't know how to do that calculation, but there's like a lot of characters there. Um, so that is uh, what the key chart is. And then there's e.handled, which is, has this key press been taken care of, which is a Boolean. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this, when you have this key press procedure, normally when the user presses a key, it travels directly to the text box and then shows up in the text box. But when you define this, proce this event procedure that handles the key press, you're actually interrupting that Key. You're, you're catching it and you're taking a look at it, you're observing it to see what's going on. Now normally when a key makes it to a text box, then Visual Studio, or sorry, Visual Basic will use this handled thing to say, okay, the key has landed in the text box, handled equals true. I don't have to worry about the key event anymore, I don't have to take care of it. However, if you catch it, if you catch a key press, and you set e.handled equals true, you're effectively telling Visual Basic to ignore the key press, but what you're really doing is you're lying to Visual Basic and you say, hey, uh, it made it to the text box. Don't worry. It's safe. Uh, it's all good. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Visual Basic believes you like a fool. Already taken care of. I don't need to worry about making sure it's already in dot text of the text box. It's all good. So, we can use this to our advantage.
because we talked about how the triparse method, right? It has trouble parsing letters or non-numeric characters or all that kind of stuff. If we want to make sure that the user is not typing in letters, and if we don't care about the minus sign or something like that, if we just want to throw out anything that's not specifically a number and they can only put in positive integers into our text box, well, we could look in the key press event, we look at the character and we say, is this a number? No. Get it out of here. E dot handled equals true. And we just get rid of it. It's that easy. So we have a couple of examples right here. The first one prevents the text box from accepting the dollar sign. No dollar signs allowed. We hate money here. Said no one ever. This catches every single key press and it examines it. If it's not the dollar sign, we don't enter this whole thing right here. We go to end if, and then we exit the procedure. The key press is not handled. Visual Basic still puts it in the text box. However, if we catch it and it is the dollar sign, then we set e.handled to true. It's normally false, by the way, because, hey, it's not handled yet. But we set it to true. We pull a sneaky little maneuver and say, hey, admit it to the text box. Don't worry about it. Visual Basic's like, all right, and it just forgets about it. And the dollar sign is just lost in the void forever, never to be seen again. And this happens every single time the user presses a key. So if they type in 20 dollar signs, this procedure gets run 20 times and 20 dollar signs get thrown into the void, never to be seen again. The other example is if we want to accept only numbers and the backspace key. Because it's tricky. If you if you don't accept the backspace key, the user can't actually get rid of their text, which is really funny. They just have to type it right the first time or else they have to close the application and try again, which could be really funny. But if you're trying to make something that's helpful for the user, maybe don't do that. Regardless. What this is doing is it's trying to throw out everything that's not the numbers and everything that's also not the backspace key. So what's what's okay for us to use, right? The number zero or the number one or the number two or the number three or so on and so on and so forth, right? Or the backspace, if it's any of those, that's totally fine. And we could type that out individually you know, key chart equals zero or key chart equals one or key chart equals two or et cetera, et cetera. We could do that individually for every single one. We don't have to do that though because, oh, and this is one of those areas where string comparisons get weird again because you can actually have things that are less than the string, like less than individual characters. We'll get to that. But the nice thing about the characters for zero and one and two and three and four and so on is that they are all adjacent. They're not the binary numbers zero, one, two, three, four. They're not represented that way, but they are adjacent. So we can say, hey, if it's less than zero, or if it's less than, or if it's greater than nine, get it out of here. It's not a digit because all the digits are between zero and nine. Even in strings, they are all between zero and nine. So if this is true, if it's less than zero or greater than nine, well, this whole thing is false, right? But it also has to not be the backspace, which is control charge dot back. That's just the special word for the backspace. So you have to check to make sure, okay, if it is not between zero and nine, and also it is not backspace, then we throw it out. We lie to visual basic. We say that it's handled, that it made it to the text box and they forget it. It gets thrown to the void, whatever. Otherwise, if this whole statement is false, either the key character was between 0 and 9, meaning that if it's between 0 and 9, this is false because it's greater than or equal to 0. And this is false because it's less than or equal to 9. So either that is true, which means that this part is false, then we can short circuit evaluation, which is why we have the and also here, or 
It could be that this is outside of the digits, which means this is true, but the uh, key char equals control chars dot back. It's the backspace key. Then this would be false, and then the whole statement would be false because we have and also. If either of these are true, if it's a digit or the backspace, we skip to end if we leave the procedure. E dot handled remains false for that key, and it makes its journey to the text box. So that's an example. I would read into this more, though, as with any everything else in the apply the concepts part of the chapter. But I really wanted to get into this to explain things like the parameters, or talk a little bit about how the um, string comparison stuff works, although we'll get into that more, all that kind of stuff. But it's a really cool use of if statements, right? Because we can handle the key press, and then throw it out there and it's never seen again. So I think that's neat, personally. Okay, well that was structures, and also like if then else. We talked, you know, I, I talked about structures in general, but it was mostly selection structures because that's this whole chapter's deal, and we're focusing on if then else primarily. There will be more to come, but, you know, this lets us conditionally execute code, which is actually a major, major part of what makes a computer a computer. The ability to sort of skip around in the program in order to do things in different orders, or maybe not do things at all, or do things selectively, or anything like that. It's a really useful thing, and that's what really separates computers away from a lot of other, like, very, very basic devices, is this ability to be conditional super easily a lot more easily than like an analog device with like gears and pulleys and stuff that has to base all that on like weird discs or whatever like um in a uh more advanced uh analog cassette player or something like that they have like weird shaped gears that have a quote unquote conditional execution based on the shape of their gears, but it's not like any time they want, it's specifically based on the gears and it's baked into the whole thing, whereas here we can actually program that jumping around of things. So that's a major, major cool thing about computers.